<laughs> Dr. Garima here again and we are going to discuss another of the Australian SBQ written exam question. But before that, uh, any new person who's watching this video, uh, I mean, I've, I've released like so many videos, over a hundred now. And I still get this question uh, over the WhatsApps and um, emails. Doctor, how to study? Studying for the part one exam could not be more easier at this present moment. All you need is a study plan, a proper study plan of each day for at least four months, outlining which book to study, which chapters to study and what mock to solve. And I have literally prepared that and given it and uploaded it rather on Facebook and on WhatsApp groups. All you have to do is just download that PDF and start by yourself if you want to study by yourself. Take that study plan. It's present on Target EDC Facebook group and file section as a PDF. First thing is that. Secondly, you need therapeutic guidelines book and infection control book and few other books for your reference. Again, those books have been uploaded and you can find those books on in the file section in the Target ADC or if you want to join some telegram group of ADC, there are so many groups and in the file section of them, you'll find therapeutic guidelines or somebody else will share it if you become part of those groups. So you don't have to break your head for it. And after this, the third thing for success and clearing the exam is solve the past papers. Past papers uh, are basically mock tests because when you solve them, it's like you're simulating the exam scenario and you're solving it. So uh, only these three things are required. It's not like two years before where nobody knew what to study and just to know what to study, you had to pay so much to so and so mentor or nothing. Like, I mean, there are many other people who are also helping like me and who have just released a lot of materials. Yeah, past papers you won't get for free because uh, each mentor, including me, have devoted hours and hours of weeks to gather those questions, formulate the options and find the right answer and then provide a feedback for it. So uh, a price has been put to that uh, depending on each person's uh, thought process. Uh, but in general, for well wishing, I think I have 27 mocks at the moment and I've priced that less than $15 per mock. I mean, this is the cheapest you can go just so that it's affordable to everybody. So books are for free. The study plan is for free. Only the past papers you've got to pay. Uh, that's it. You, you study uh, by yourself. I mean, you don't have to be at the beck and call of anyone. You're doing your clinical job. Fair enough. In between study. Uh, four hours a day, you take it out, solve one mock every week or since there are 27 mocks now, you can solve like two mocks every week and just be consistent with your practice and I see no reason why you should be struggling or uh, having that FOMO, fear of missing out by joining 10 different groups. See, the more groups you join, the more confusion you're going to create because uh, nobody's going to give out the correct answer because nobody has the ADC answer paper key. Uh, those people who have passed the exam like me will use their own analytical thoughtful process to figure out the correct answer because since we have passed the exam we feel this is what should be right because this is how we would have attempted in the exam and based on the concept it also feels that this answer should be right so every person has a different mindset and uh, if you're going to join 10 different groups then you will end up getting confused you will stress yourself out and then you will feel that it's a very difficult hard exam and then in case you don't clear it's because you wasted a lot of time on wasteful things yeah the new new word is wasteland right uh, that is what i'm learning from the teens these days so uh, yeah don't do that just, just follow these three things and you're on your way to success if you're doing that dedicatedly. So, uh, yeah, so that, that's about for all the candidates who are worried or are first time or are seeing this video for the first time. Anyways, uh, nice, nice question we are going to do today. Uh, this, this kind of scenario, so far I have not seen in my own practice yet because probably I'm in pedo, but even when I was an intern or was practicing general dentistry at some point of time, thankfully I didn't see such a case. 
uh, but you may see one in your life and uh, you should know what to do when you see one, right? <laughs> So uh, we are going to talk about the bilateral mandibular dislocation, which is corrected by the procedure called as daughterly procedure, and the question is asked in the exam about it. So let's see what is the question. You are working in an uh, oral and maxillofacial department and have been called to examine an abor aboriginal patient who presents with bilateral dislocation of the TMJ. You have conducted a comprehensive examination of the patient. Okay. Why that term Aboriginal is mentioned? Uh, okay, let us see. You will get a question in your part two in your communication OSCEs, definitely 100% out of that six stations. One station would be for Aboriginal and uh, Torres Island uh, people. Uh, and in your part one exam also. So you need to understand why these questions are going to be asked. And uh, even recently, the ADC again issued a candidate lounge newspaper. And in that also, they had mentioned this very specifically. They believe, uh, they very rightly believe actually, uh, that Aboriginal and the Indigenous Australians are the original custodians of the Australia. You have to understand what the term Indigenous means, first of all. So I have uh, Googled it literally. Uh, so that I don't say anything by mistake. So indigenous means uh, originating or occurring naturally in a particular place as the native. Or with regards to people, it means inhabiting uh, or existing in uh, land from the earliest times or, or before the arrival of colonies also. So basically, these are the original people uh, who were always there even before somebody invaded them. You know, the colonies, the British, Spanish, French or whatever European colonies or some other colonies and mixed the population. So these group of people are very pure and uh, they have some natural thing with it from where they belong to, which also includes some health conditions, which are like cardiovascular and uh, coronary heart disease certain forms of cancer, certain respiratory diseases and musculoskeletal conditions because their genetic composition is made in such a way which is heavily influenced by the environment that they are brought in and they are not uh, corrupted or rendered impure by mixing of species, you know, they, they are in their purest form. So their structure and the conditions that they may have are by default it's not their fault it's it's by by genetics by naturally inhabiting in those areas so they also come with a certain set of cultural beliefs and uh, they are raised in a certain environment which you have to respect and you should be respecting with full your heart and such populations can exist in a lot of places around the world. Since we are dealing with Australia, I'm talking just about the Aboriginals and Indigenous Australians. There can be many Indigenous populations of different countries as well. So whichever country you go to and you find an Indigenous person from there, be respectful for their culture. So, and be also mindful that they may be suffering from certain conditions by default. Okay. Now, knowing, having have this knowledge, now let's go to the question. So, you're, you are in OMF department, you come, there's a person with an open mouth because there's bilateral mandibular dislocation and you've done your examination. So, so yeah, the first question being, uh, what is the next step to confirm the diagnosis? So whenever you see any mandibular dislocation happening, the first thing you do is take an OPG to see uh, if there is an fracture in the condyle or it's just dislocated because the patient happened to open the mouth like really wide or there is some musculoskeletal condition because of which the patient opened wide and it just easily got dislocated. So uh, intraoral radiograph will not give you a picture of the mandibular condyle. Occlusal radiograph will also not help. So the only good option here is OPG and hence I'm going to go with that. Now, how to tell the patient? Talk to him and show him the radiograph. Treat him like any other normal patient and this is what you should do. Talk to his family first and show the radiograph. Now, the patient came to you. You should be respectful and have direct communication with the patient. Fix the dislocation without explanation. Well, 
do you know what a dietary procedure is? You have to, I'll show you how the dietary procedure is. I've got a very nice video on YouTube. So basically that procedure involves you to wear gloves and then put your thumbs in the mouth. So that's kind of an intrusive and invasive thing. And, and you can't do that without explaining to the patient, right? It's like crossing a boundary and being unprofessional and you can't do that. So you would first talk to him and show him the radiograph then explain him the entire condition. And only after he gives you the consent, you'll do that procedure. Is that clear? Now, what is the most important aspect of cultural safety to consider when providing care for a patient who identifies as indigenous? So this is what we were speaking about before. Perform a special ceremony before the procedure to honor the patient's cultural belief. Uh, you don't have to perform any ceremony. You just have to be very respectful. Uh, take time to explain the matter and do not rush the patient. That is true. Be quick as they have emphasis on time. And no, the option B is the more appropriate one where you take time to explain the matter and do not rush the patient. Like be very respectful, be slow if they don't understand. Explain them appropriately. Then, I think something changed in this question. The question was, how would you do the procedure? Oh, I think the video got paused. Wait. Hi, yes. Uh, yeah, my son uh, <laughs> took the mouse and <laughs> you saw him, right? So anyways, uh, how would you do the procedure? I think that was the question out here which got deleted. So anyways, uh, yeah. So regarding this, uh, I would like to show you a video first. I've got a very nice video and uh, let's see. When the mouth opens wider than 2 cm, the jawbone moves forward and down along the articular eminence of the skull and out of the joint socket. A TMJ dislocation occurs when the mandibular condyle gets displaced in front of the articular eminence and becomes trapped in this position. The jaw is unable to close in this position because the coronoid process which normally moves deep to the zygomatic process is now hitting the cheekbone or maxilla. In order to reduce this dislocation back into normal position, the jaw must move downwards and back. However, this downward movement is not easy to accomplish because of the mesoderm muscle, which acts to keep pulling the jaw upward, resisting the downward movement that is required. As such, medications to relax the mesoderm muscle may be required, including propofol or benzodiazepines. Overall, the goal is to move the jaw downwards and back. Once the jaw has been pushed downwards, the chin is lifted upwards to complete the reduction. In order to perform this reduction, the doctor places the thumbs over the back jaw molars. In order to protect the thumb, gauze should be wrapped around the thumb. A strong and firm push is then performed oriented both downwards and back. Once the jaw has been pushed downwards, the fingers closer to the chin then pulls upward at the same time, thereby completing the reduction. Afterwards, the patient should not open the mouth widely. At times, a chin strap or bandage may be required to help keep a dislocation from happening again. Eat soft foods to allow the TMJ area to heal. Apply ice to the area to help with swelling and pain. So, I hope this video was very clear as to how to perform the procedure. Basically, it's you wrap the fingers around the gauze, you place it on the last of the molars, stabilize the head, downwards, backwards, upwards. This is the motion of it. Now, uh, how would you do the procedure? And I think the question also mentions, uh, what would you instruct the patient afterwards? I'll, I'll just break this up question a bit. The answer should be warn the patient not to open their mouth immediately after reduction because you have just reduced it. You don't want the condyle to again just directly go and create an issue again. So let the muscles relax and be in the right position. What is not indicated in the relocation procedure? It is. So, uh, yeah, where we were. What is not uh, included in the relocation procedure? It is important that the head is supported while you carry out the maneuver. That is true. So that is included. Stand in front of the patient. That is also true. Place your thumbs on the external oblique ridge or the occlusal surface of the lower molars. That is also true. We just saw it. 
relocate the job by pushing backwards only. That is not true. If you just push backwards, nothing is going to happen because the coronite process and the cornella process both are stuck. So first, you have to push it downwards and dislocate them from the eminences which are getting obstructed above. You may find it easier to replace one side first and then the other. No, never. You have to do it both simultaneously. So the answer should be relocate the jaw by pushing backwards only. Uh, the option E uh, can also be correct, but because it's usually done simultaneously. But yeah. he again took my mouse away. So, uh, but it's not entirely wrong, wrong. You want better? Yeah, he hit my mouse now. Uh, I will choose the option D because that is definitely wrong. But if that option wasn't there, I would have chosen option E. So I hope this is clear and another presentation on a bit of TMJ issues that we have done. I want you all to uh, read more on TMJ and I'll end this video right now because he's getting in a very mischievous mode. Uh, but yeah, I hope this, this is more clear to you about the aboriginals, the indigenous and uh, how you're supposed to manage them and how you're supposed to manage this kind of procedure if you come across it. All right. Thanks. Again, uh, leave your comment. Uh, you know, I like reading that.